Hi, can you still hear us? It's okay? Yeah. Uh, okay, I'm the last thing between you and the end of the conference, so I'm <laughs> going to go as quickly as I can. Um, this is a bit our left field and uh, completely nothing to do with what the other two have just been talking about, so I am aware of that. Um, it's a paper that um, I wrote with Anne Kolk in uh, Amsterdam, um, mainly in reaction to a call for papers. Uh, in the Journal of Business Ethics, which is still in the process of being reviewed for, so hopefully it'll work. Um, so it's a bit also out of left field for me. So it was also a process of uh, getting involved in some literature I'm not particularly uh, up to date with and pulling together some arguments which are also quite new for me. So I thought it was quite interesting, the post process that we went through to write this, so I thought it might be interesting for some of you, although it is quite different to a lot of what we've been hearing about today. Um, so I'm going to go very quickly through the theoretical background, because most of you aren't interested in international business theory, uh, but we needed theoretical background, obviously, because one does in order to get published, so we looked at the liability of foreigners literature, which is some literature that has been developed quite a lot in the international business area in the last few years. Uh, looking at difficulties that companies face usually when investing in foreign markets and the nature of those difficulties. And one of those difficulties, of course, is difficulties with the government of the country in question, regulatory problems, uh, and I would put uh, trade policy in that, in that area. Recently, a couple of uh, academics have been pointing out that foreignness is not a uniform concept, that there are different kinds of foreigners and that certain companies coming from certain types of countries are more likely to have difficulties in the host country than others. So there's something called the liability of origin, uh, which is a theoretical concept so far, which hasn't really been developed empirically very much. So we wanted to sort of build on that literature a bit and say, well, yes, in the case of these Chinese companies that we're looking at, there was clearly a China, Chinese-ness that was relevant to the way in which the whole case came out. So we have to have a gap in the literature, of course, so we did. <laughs> so most of the work that's been done on liabilities of foreigners has been done on investment, not on trade. And we are trying to make a point that actually trading is also subject to difficulties with local host countries. Uh, liability of origin has been very underdeveloped, apart from saying Yes, there might be something different between different kinds of foreign companies. We haven't really looked at it a great deal. Um, and there's a whole load of literature coming out of international business on these new emerging market uh, MNEs from China, BRICS, and so on. Um, and whether these are different to existing multinational companies or not. So we also wanted to bring in a bit that literature. We had to talk about ideology because the call for tenders, or the call for papers was on ideology. So, <laughs> and the first set of reviews said there's not enough about ideology in this paper, so we pulled some more in. Um, but actually it was quite interesting because I've been working on the, the case previously. This is the anti-dumping case. And clearly ideology is within it, but I hadn't actually looked at it systematically until I had to do this paper. Uh, and as I was looking through the debates around the case, when you look at it from the angle of, well, where is ideology in all this? Ideology is, is everywhere, <laughs> if you start to look for it. Um, so we have to bring in some ideolo ideology. Uh, there is, of course, quite a lot on this in political science. Uh, and there is some work on the way in which ideological differences between different kinds of countries can be used to transform a debate or to frame a debate, uh, particularly in the case of the Canadian oil sands, where Originally, they were thought of as being dirty, and then there was a whole framing of the debate by NGOs and others and by the Canadian government, uh, which basically framed their oil sands, in spite of being dirty, as being somehow ethical, because where most oil comes from is countries that are not democratic, that do not have the kind of ethical systems of governance that Canada has. So never mind that it's dirty, it's ethical and therefore it's good, you know. So this is clearly an ideologically based uh, framing. So that, there was some work done on that, which was interesting. And we thought, given the ideological differences between China 
and the Western market would be interesting to look at it from this kind of a point of view. So many of you will know already what happened in the solar panel case, but just very briefly, it's the biggest case that has been launched uh, by the EU in, in recent years. Uh, 21 billion was the figure that was bandied about. I can't find that in the trade figures. I think probably DG Trade made some mistakes on the calculations, but Lars isn't here, so I can't complain about that. Uh, yes, it was big, but I don't think it was as big as the figures that were bandied about in the beginning. Um, anyway, there was a set of uh, um, indigenous firms that complained to the European Commission and asked for uh, protection from these dumped solar panels who, who were put together in an ad hoc group person. Another ad hoc group, AFASA, was set up by Trina Solar, effectively, from what I can make out, although that's never officially said anywhere. Trina Solar is a Chinese company, which is obviously major interest in the uh, in European market. Set up by Trina Solar and a couple of um, other companies, both Chinese and import-dependent companies. Um, and they were, um, were very active in this, in this whole case, did a lot of uh, lobbying, said, come up with some lovely, lovely big figures, everyone likes big figures in trade policy, so they came up with lots of figures about how bad this would be. Um, and there was a huge debate about it. And this huge debate obviously gave us quite a lot of data that we could have a look at and see what, what happened, what, what were the key arguments, what was the discussion all about. And the discussion was about jobs, the discussion was about energy independence and energy dependence. Um, the discussion was also about ideological differences and the, the right way of organizing your economy and the right way of supporting industry and, and so on. China was disadvan is disadvantaged in anti-dumping cases because it's not market economy status, and this was certainly used by those who were supporting the anti-dumping duties to paint Chinese companies as somehow all uh, subject to, uh, to um, non-market forces. Uh, the German government's position was quite important in this whole uh, debate, and they were quite ambiguous all through. And we had clear examples of retaliatory dumping from, from the very beginning with the polysilicon case, uh, and towards the end with a new case against wine. So China's role in this was quite important, quite beyond, apart from what was happening in the companies themselves. So it's case study, mainly qualitative. We interviewed the key actors on the lobbying side. Couldn't interview the European Commission because they didn't want to be interviewed. Um, we looked at company reports, press releases. The companies were, uh, the, the two actors were extremely active in getting information out there. Afaza paid an independent consultancy to come up with lots of figures about how dreadful dumping would be. Uh, ProSun paid another independent consultancy to come up with another uh, report which said, no, 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 it's going to be much worse if we don't. Uh, so there was a huge amount of debate we had a look at. Uh, and as I said, looking at it from this point of view of like, where is the ideological element in, in all of these arguments. So we tried to pull all that out. Uh, this is just a the context. Yes, of course, there was huge increases in Chinese exports coming up to the case. It's not a big surprise that when you get large increases in market share by a relatively low cost actor, the anti dumping increases will be large. So if you look at the figures, it's not that surprising what happened. So this is our little table that we, um, we came up with. Uh, basically, looking at the different points of view, who had used what arguments, and trying to put that into some kind of a theoretical frame in terms of liability to foreigners and liability to foreigners. Or, uh, the threat from Chinese uh, manufacturers in this area is in some ways quite different to the threat from footwear or clothing that we've had 10 years, 15 years ago. Uh, because it was also about high quality jobs and technology and leading edge technology. So it's not just about sort of people sewing clothes in Portugal or Italy. It's, it's about people in high-tech jobs in important industries for the future of Europe. And that was very much something that was, uh, was highlighted by, by the, the four camp. They were talking about the future of our technology and the future 
of renewable energies, and we need to be there. We can't afford to give this away to China. Um, Proton used every legal avenue, and they are still, as uh, the lady said this morning, it's not really finished this case because uh, it's still ongoing in the sense that Proton are still appealing. Uh, there has been a new discussion very just recently on the minimum price undertaking, which was the final result, um, where Proton are saying that the minimum price is being distorted by Chinese exporters. So it's been a very, very long winding process. The threat to energy security has been uh, also something that's been used quite extensively in the case. Like you would think, you know, Europe is trying to get towards a sort of low carbon future. Solar panels are cheap, great, you know, brilliant. We're going to get our 2020, 20%, 20 uh, no problem. Um, but ProSum were arguing that actually this was bad for renewable energy because too much low too much low cost solar panels would overburden the system and therefore reduce support for the system. Uh, so there was quite circular and complicated arguments being, being uh, pulled uh, around. <laughs> there was a lot of subtle and not very subtle uh, attacks on, on the Chinese. In this and this is where really we, talk, we got to the ideology of all this. And particularly as the case went on, <coughs> The attacks got more and more venomous against these shady middlemen and these sort of tr this trickery that was going on in the system. Um, and uh, that was clearly very much linked to, to the nature of the uh, institutions where these companies came from and, we could, and the capacity to cast dispersions about the whole of the economic system because of the fact that uh, the system is ideologically different. So Chinese companies don't exist, it's China, most of, most of the time. So China is stealing our jobs, China is flooding our markets. Uh, so the notion of individual actors in the economic space in China is the non-existent in the vision of, of the way in which they, they present things. They used, they, I must say they had a very sophisticated PR machine. They, uh, the, the against supporters, they had a very good website. Uh, they bought in resources from the local uh, community, PR. They had G Plus as their PR company. Anyone who knows Brussels knows that G Plus is quite well placed and uh, pretty well known. Uh, they had a very good legal team, which I talked to a couple of times, who have worked a lot on anti dumping cases and were quite effective and efficient in uh, putting their positions forward. So, in terms of the liability of foreigners literature, buying in of local resources is a key way that companies should get over their difficulties, and it's certainly something they try to do. Um, and they also put more and more these local actors as spokespeople for the discussion in the, in the, uh, in the public space. So Chinese companies over time became less and less involved in the debate, and more and more we had Dutch or German are the PR people coming and discussing how important this was for Europe. Clearly, the foreignness of the actors was an issue in terms of putting their positions forward, and they changed that very much over time. Um, some of the debates, some of the arguments that the Chinese and import-dependent firms used was very much about global value chains. You know, this is an international industry. How can you put in a nationality on an industry that? has polysilicon from Germany and elements from Korea and other elements from Japan and then glass from, uh, from Germany. Um, these empirical analyses were, were also quite important in the debate. Um, NGOs got involved, which was quite interesting. Um, apparently spontaneously, the World Wildlife Fund and some others came up with a press release uh, disagreeing quite strongly with the, uh, the whole case, uh, which of course Prosun uh, criticized quite strongly. Um, and uh, overall, um, there was some very clear elements of the debate which were related to where these companies came from, and over time that caused the companies to, to disengage to some extent from the public debate 
um, and uh, leave the debate more to, um, to local actors. So this is just a couple of the, um, the, the comments we had. I quite like uh, this one. Something pro-Sunners will be using, waving a red communist flag and saying these nasty communists are stealing our jobs. Uh, of course, they don't say it quite so directly, but as time went on, they've got more and more like that. And uh, so China is different. China is not the same as Korea and Japan, but this is fundamentally a completely different kind of competition. Uh, this is just to show you that over time, the nine Chinese companies that have been involved in the beginning of the launching of Apple have disappeared. What they were very good at was getting an international coalition within the EU, which included Croatia, even before it became a member. So they were very, very good at getting local import-dependent firms to and export-dependent firms, because some of the poly polysilicon producers who were being targeted by an anti-dumping case from uh, China were also involved. Uh, so a very active and extremely uh, dynamic group. Um, the, the results you probably mainly know, uh, there was conclusion that there was dumping, huge debate in Brussels uh, after the provisional um, anti-dumping duties were imposed. Finally we got an agreement, not before China had launched another case against wine, which was quite critical in France, where I live. Uh, <laughs> the first time I've ever seen anti-dumping make the first page of the Sudwest. <laughs> Trade policy is never on the front page of the Sudwest. And then all of a sudden, wine is targeted by the Chinese and it's there, front page news. Uh, so we ended up with this minimum price on the KK. Um, so you could see it as, an, as a, a, a win for the, the Chinese and their import dependent firms, although uh, it was quite a destructive discussion in some ways and quite. Um, quite a complicated one. In terms of our conclusions, well, yes, these firms obviously are facing liability of the foreigners. Uh, there was a clear harnessing of this, this China threat, China's different, China's going to run over the world and we need to do something. This is the end, thin end of the wedge if we don't. And this was said in a couple of press releases. You know. Today it's solar panels, tomorrow it will be sort of airplanes and trains and automobiles and there'll be left, nothing left. Uh, Chinese companies got involved and this is something that happened in the footwear case but less high profile. This was one of the first times that export dependent firms from another country started to really get involved in the public debate, at least in the EU. Although it happened also in the US in the same kind of a case a couple of months previously. So it was very much about Chineseness, so liability of origin, we can clearly see here. Um, and certain kinds of discrimination are more, yeah, I'm finished now. So, <clears throat> in terms of the implications for trade policy, I thought I'd better say something about trade policy, given this is supposed to be a trade policy audience. So, <clears throat> yes, this diversity in ideological context, context does create, obviously, uh, conflicts that are going to be quite difficult to, um, to solve sometimes. Um, in terms of the different interests of the EU for ProSun, the interests for environmental protection are not more important than the China threat. We need to make sure that we sort out this threat and we'll save the planet later, kind of thing. Um, there is always a risk of, of a backlash in this kind of context when you have large increases in trade. That, that's self-evident. Um, in this case, they managed to present it as being predatory and unfair. Um, a very interesting aspect of this case for me was this capacity to create alliances between the Chinese companies and, and the local import dependent firms and export dependent firms. Um, and that was quite new. These ad hoc groups are something we've only seen in the last few years of emerging. And as I say, something very similar happened in the US the year before. So these are new actors in, in trade policy, created partly because for the existing trade associations 